Welcome to another episode of the Carolyn Glick Show. As I know you all know, um, much of the criticism against Israel from the international community, such as it is since the outset of Israel's ground operation in uh, Gaza, has been the alleged high casualty, casualty toll. Uh, there have also been allegations that Israel really isn't getting anywhere in its war. Hamas alleges that there are 30,000 plus uh, Gazans who have been killed in the war, and they say that 70% of the casualties have been women and children. Over the weekend, there was an important article in Tablet Magazine that I cited earlier this week and in Focus that was written by a uh, Wharton statistician named Abraham Weiner, and he explained that from a mathematical perspective, those uh, casualty rates make absolutely no sense. At any rate, one of the people who was first to point out that a lot of the criticisms of Israel's war operation in Gaza are inaccurate, and they simply uh, fail to understand both the nature of the war that Israel is fighting and also the extent to which it's going in order to prevent uh, civilian casualties, is Professor John Spencer, who's the chair of the Urban Warfare uh, chair of Urban Warfare Studies at the Modern War Institute at the U.S. Military Academy at West Point. Um, and he has become quite a celebrity here in Israel based upon his analyses of the war that have been published in two different articles in Newsweek. Uh, and he was here a couple of weeks ago on the ground with IDF forces. And it's my pleasure to have Pre uh, Professor Spencer here on the program today to talk about his research and his assessment of Israel's war. Uh, in Gaza. So first of all, welcome to you, Professor John Spencer. Thank you very much for joining me on the Carolyn Glick Show today. Well, thanks for having me. Really, it's an honor. Well, can you can you start? It's The honor is all mine. Um, but can you start us out and explain to us, you know, how you've, um, how you, how you even approach an assessment of Israel's operations on the ground in Gaza? W what are you looking at first and foremost when you're trying to make your assessment of the success and of the level of the lethality, et cetera. Sure. So the first thing I'm looking at, so um, one is the compare and contrast to anything that's happened before. Since I've been studying this type of warfare only, uh, urban warfare, fighting in cities, in dense urban areas. So the first thing I looked at was the challenges. So the nature of the terrain, the density of it, uh, the construction of the buildings, the tunnel complexes, which are you know, just never been faced before. The fact that the the enemy Hamas built all of its military infrastructure underneath the civilians on purpose. The rockets that are emanating from the combat areas, uh, the hostages. So strictly from an analytical perspective is that we have to look at all the variables which are present that the idea faced at the beginning of the war and, and continue to face and then try to make a comparison to any other like situation. And this is where I think the world is really ignorant of war. One, a lot of the world just woke up to what war looks like. Uh, and two is that they continue to compare anything going on in Gaza to a counterterrorism or counterinsurgency operation. Um, and while Hamas is a terrorist organization, it's also an army. It's a massive, it was a massive army of over 30,000 fighters set up in military organizations, mostly light infantry battalions of over 30, 30 battalions. And it was controlling land. It had built defenses over 15 years. All of the comparisons really are wrong that everybody tries to make. Everything from the numbers to the destruction to the level of bombs that are dropped. All of them are comparing Gaza to some other situation that has nothing to do with a war that is more like a state-on-state -state war I mean, it's a territory. It's not a state, but it's a territory with a governing power and a massive military with huge amounts of military capability. You really have to go back to World War II style battles to compare it against. Can I ask you one second about those capabilities? Well, what you're describing here really is a very powerful enemy. So can you just explain how do you assess the strength of Hamas? Sure. So by just by the fact that they're an army... It, is the fact that they're they're t completely military faction with over thirty thousand units, um, with assigned battalions, with assigned geographic areas to defend. So in warfare, we say that defense is always the strongest form of warfare, and we do what's called a, you know combat power analysis. And and what it if you're in the defensive positions, 
and Hamas has had 15 plus years to build defensive positions, this all increases their combat capability. Yes, they don't have an air force. They don't have armor and tanks. They're mostly light infantry, but they're in probably the, I mean, the most strong defensive terrain that could ever be created. Like they're literally bomb proof bunkers underneath every house. I mean, there's 400 miles of tunnels that range from 15 feet to 300 feet underground where no military munition can reach. No, yes, mil, you know, you have lots of um, drones and things above, but you can't see through concrete. You can't see underneath the buildings. Uh, it's immense defensive capability. And that, but also the rocket supply. So the fact that Hamas has launched over 12,000 rockets at Israel's civilian site, every one of them a war crime, is part of their combat power. And they have continued, although the number has gone down and on some days it's zero, to launch rockets at Israel adds to their what capabilities they have as in a, their, their ability to resist the IDF, which is not their goal actually, but as a military combat power. The fact that they're sitting in these defenses waiting for attack and have been planning for that for 15 years really doesn't matter how big the, the Israel defense is or how powerful they are. Um, this is the idea. What do you that- mean by when you, well, let me just interrupt for one second. What do you mean when you say that their goal is not to, um, what did you say that their goal is not to beat the IDF or it's right. not to, yeah. it's not you know, uh, successfully confront the IDF forces from Gaza. So what's their goal? Yeah. Th- their goal, um, and, and if they're successful, they win. Their goal was to attack, to invade Israel, which they did. And they had, they had much larger goals. And I think people, um, either aren't aware or don't understand how much larger the goals of Hamas were on October 7th, but they also wanted the counterattack. And then in the counterattack, it wasn't to, you usually in military operations, you want to destroy the other military and defeat them on the field of battle. That's not what Hamas strategy. Hamas is a political military strategy. They did the attack. They wanted the counterattack. And then they wanted to hold in the tunnels and using the hostages and just buy time for the international community, namely the United States, to stop the IDF in their operations. And then politically, they have gained immense power in the region and around the world as the people who struck at Israel and survived. Their only goal is to survive, which is very unique. It's not even to hold ground. Sometimes you might say you have a terrain-based strategy where they want to hold their cities, hold their ground. It's all about time. And they want to survive the counterattack. They want to survive Israel's attack against them, which gives them immense political power. And they get to, if they survive in any way, they have strategically won the war. So I want to talk to you for a second then about Israel, and then we'll go back to the uh, strategic ends here. Um, so you go through, I think it was in your first article in Newsweek, and uh, you started explaining how on uh, basically every parameter, um, now I'm looking for my notes. Um, Israel is Israel is abiding entirely uh, by international law. That the concept that Israel is disproportionately attacking um, that or causing disproportionate harm to civilians when it attacks uh, Hamas targets is both unmeasurable and wrong. So can you just go through a couple of the parameters that you laid out uh, in in your analysis of how Israel is fighting? And then I'd like your assessment of Israel's success so far. Yeah, I think the first part is, um, of course, everybody agreed that Israel had the right of self-defense and to launch the war against Hamas. They were attacked, UN Charter. You don't even have to request permission. You can just notify the United Nations on Article 51 that you can respond. And then you get into the law of proportionality, which that word has gotten you know, basically hijacked by the world on what is proportionality. In war, in a war of self-defense, it's proportionate to remove the imminent threat to you. That's it. So on the larger scale proportionality is, are you using the appropriate force to remove the threat? In this case, it's in Hamas, an existential threat, especially with the rockets to Israel, not just with the attack. And the goal of the war has been very clear since day one, bring the hostages home, destroy Hamas, and secure Israel's border. Proportionality in the overall war is use the force required to remove that threat, which has been daily with the rockets. The other aspect of proportionality is use the force, you know, only target a military target 
use the force appropriate to that target. And then even when you're, if it's appropriate, you assess what the collateral damage will be. Um, and, and it is the military value, which get into people still deny. And most people don't even talk about the fact that the, this is a, an existential war. Hamas tried to, I mean, not only what it did on October 7th, its goal is to destroy Israel and all the Jewish people. It's an existential threat, which gets into the calculation of proportionality of like, I am removing this existential threat. Now, in my other articles, based of, of both watching, knowing the idea um, and being on the, the ground twice now in, in Gaza, is you know, even when you take in this, it's a military necessity, you're using proportional force. In my opinion, it's overwhelming force, not over in the other term. It's overwhelming force. And that's what militaries do. You want to strike with overwhelming force and destroy your enemy. Uh, that doesn't mean you don't follow the laws of war, but you do. Even with that, you have to take all feasible precautions, is what it's called, to limit civilian harm. Uh, only strike military targets. And when you're doing so, take all precautions to limit. And this is what I laid out in my article in Newsweek, is that not only has Israel done every f known action to limit civilian harm, they've gone above that and now are doing things that no military has done in the history of warfare. Like the fact that, yes, if you... If you know you're going into an urban area, you give warning that you're going and you give the civilians time to evacuate. And that's what Israel did in the north. Now, how you do that has usually been you surround the civilian area and drop flyers and you give you set up evacuation uh, lanes and zones for the civilians to go to. Well, Israel did that just like the United States did in the Battle of Mosul and the Battle of Fallujah. But what Israel also did was, you know, millions of phone calls soldiers sitting on phones calling into the into Gaza, into the areas they were going into, text messages, uh, drones with speakers, uh, airdropping speakers onto the ground, all giving them days and weeks for the civilians to evacuate. And as the war progressed, the, Israel also gave out their military maps, which you know they got a little bit of credit for, but I, I've never seen it. They gave out their... I mean, I... I it was funny because when I was reading, when I was reading over those articles before we had this conversation, I started shaking my head and I said, how can a military that gives this kind of notification to its enemy that it's coming in and specifically where it's coming and telling them you should leave, how, how can such an operation have a chance of being successful? I mean, how do you... How do you assess that? You know, no, no military has ever taken these kinds of steps to prevent harm to civilians, and nobody has ever been accused of harming civilians the way that Israel has, of course. But I mean, how can Israel win under these circumstances? How can you defeat your enemy when you're giving them this kind of notification? Yeah, it, it makes it significantly more difficult. Absolutely. Um, and again, these are the steps that were taken during major counter insurgency and counter terrorist operations like the operations against ISIS but I think this again where people fail ICE yes ISIS and, and Hamas share a lot of the vicious tactics of brutality but they're completely different ISIS was an insurgent force in Iraq and Syria in which the nation of Iraq and, and, and we helped them try to expel those insurgent forces from their territory this is a military army that you're attacking so yeah absolutely it makes it harder that you signal to your enemy every step that you're making um, you give your your maps out to the enemy and you tell the enemy exactly where you're going to be all in the pursuit of limiting civilian harm and this is what we've seen right we've seen hamas who was in northern gaza although many of them were destroyed but the hostages the hamas senior leadership just moved wherever the civilians were told to move to usually through a tunnel so absolutely, this is the kind of the, the question nobody wants to ask is that, I mean, usually we don't give warning in actual wars. The United States didn't give warning in Panama, in Iraq, in Afghanistan. Russia, who doesn't follow the laws of war, didn't give warning in Ukraine, in Chechnya. Um, because you give away what's the vital thing in wars to end wars quickly is surprise and the, you know, the shock and all, the overwhelming speed of your operations, if you have to stop and tell the enemy exactly where you're going to be, but that's where we're at. It's just unfortunate. Even in the maps that Israel gave out, 
Um, they will tell. The question is just: is that is, is that even effective? Then I mean, do you have any? Because you do have an assessment of Israel's success rate. That's what. That's what is also so remarkable about your analysis. Not only do you point out the, in a way, self-defeating lengths that Israel goes to in order to protect civilians, but you also then talk about how successful Israel is. So can you give a little bit of that as well? Sure. Um, and this is where I tried to compare. One, I gave people, I told people to stop comparing Israel's operation in Gaza to counterterrorism operations. Um, there is no comparison. Actually, even in war, if I go back to World War II, the only battle I could find that has any of the properties is the Battle of Manila, where the Japanese had held American prisoners of war and civilians for years, and MacArthur told them to go, you know, basically do the operation to bring those hostages, prisoners of war, home. Um, and in that operation, there were 17,000 Japanese defenders. Uh, we attacked with around 37,000 American forces. And, and MacArthur didn't want the city destroyed, but we killed 100,000 civilians taking that city. So in my Out assessment- Out of a total population of- 1.1 1. 1 million. Of a million, right? Yeah. So this is the problem. I, I know we'll talk about it, but uh, I don't like even talking about the numbers because that's not how wa war works. And I don't want future wars being, well, yeah, but you have the right to conduct this war, but what's your civilian to combatant death ratio going to be? Like that's not- how war works. It's not how the laws of war work in general. Yes, war is politics, so there is a moral kind of belief of what's going on. But so from metrics of the idea, so despite all these hurdles, and and there is no comparison to even the challenges, right? So 30,000 fighters in military grade tunnels underneath cities um, who want as many civilians to die, which is unique as well, although the Japanese also wanted the Philippine people to die. So there's some similarities there. But by every metric in which you assess a military operation, so time, like how long does it take you to take away the enemy's territory or clear urban terrain? The IDF cleared northern Gaza in, in two months. It took nine months for 100,000 Iraqi security forces backed by the greatest air power of the world, the United States and the coalition. It took them nine months to clear one city. And the IDF have cleared multiple, you know, six cities in northern Gaza in two months with an enemy force that nobody's faced. So you buy terrain in speed, by the number of enemy combatants killed, the number of battalions they've destroyed now, in five months they destroyed 18 of the 24 coherent Hamas battalions. So by that metric, incredible speed. The number of IDF soldiers killed, although everyone unfortunate, is in incredibly lower than anybody in with any knowledge of military operations would have expected in urban warfare for the IEF to take. Uh, the Iraqi security forces lost 10,000 soldiers in trying to take the battle, you know, the, the city of Mosul away from 3,000 to 5,000 ISIS fighters. Uh, so by every metric, enemy killed, terrain taken, losses of, of themselves, of the IDF, the IDF are really... And I don't like to continually use the historic, but their performance and effectiveness has actually been actually higher than any other operation with any similar traits and as well as the civilian casualties. And this gets to the numbers, right? So how many civilian casualties have died in Gaza can't be known. It's just period. Like I've never seen, and I study urban battles for a living where you could have a daily ro running count of how many civilians have died. Just think about it. I mean, it's war. Um, even in the Battle of Mosul, it was a year after the war ended, and the Iraqi forces said that we don't know how many died. The, the well, numbers What's so crazy were, is, of course, that Israel, it took us, I think, over a month to figure out the number of people who Hamas murdered on October 7th, and we're a, a modern state, and we have state-of-the-art... Uh, um, uh, first, first responders, and you know, then afterwards going through and trying to identify the remains of people who had been incinerated, etc. It took us a really long time to get through with the work. And here, you're assessing that an enemy that is underground, that is losing control of territory, that he actually has instantaneous, credible data. And what's even more bizarre about the international communities and particularly the U.S. government's willingness to credence these numbers is that, you know, in real time, they've been exposed as false in many, many 
uh, incidents. You know, I mean, I'm just thinking, first of all, about the hospital that they claimed that uh, the Hamas alleged that Israel had attacked with a missile when it was actually their own missile that had attacked there and that there were 500 people dead, which they knew, you know, one minute after the uh, missile fell and everybody was demanding an instant explanation and and everything else. And so it, 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 it's the same thing. I mean, it goes on and on and on. We see the falsity of their of their allegations. We see that they have no credibility. And then we see this incredible willingness on the part of people who who know better, not should know better, but actually do know better, to credence the numbers as fact. Yeah, it is unfortunate. And I can say, as a military analyst, 30,000 civilians have not died in Gaza. It's there's just no, it's just not a fact. One, you don't, you, there's no way to know the number. And two, that number accounts for zero Hamas militants. So in war, there's two categories. There's combatants and non-combatants. Civilians who are not partaking in, in the hostilities are non-combatants. Um, the Hamas-generated number from the Gaza Health Ministry includes zero combatants killed. So it, it includes every Hamas fighter who has died in the war. So there's not 30,000 civilians that have died. And there's really no way to know the number. But yeah, even if it was 30,000, if you subtract the number of combatants that if you don't believe Israel for some reason and you just want to take a terrorist's numbers, um, how many combatants have died versus non-combatants? But the question is, Carolyn, is if that's the number, but you're saying it's too much. Um, I've never seen a war, nor do I want a war in which we say, yeah, I know it's an existential threat to your survival uh, and you have every right to fight back. And I know they still have your hostages. And I know they still are launching rockets literally um, two miles from your your civilian populations but the civilian casualties despite you following every law of war is too much so you have to stop that would change the world and would would lead to a much violent more violent world because this would show the world that every terrorist organization of the world would start taking hostages embed themselves in the civilian population and that's what hamas did hamas really built a strategy in to lead to this it's like the world is falling into hamas's trap Hamas built all of their military infrastructure underneath civilians, under hospitals, schools, under civilian homes. And they want as many civilians to die as possible. Literally, the 2.2 million people who live in Gaza could fit in Hamas's tunnels easily. It's over 400 miles of tunnels, but there are no civilians allowed in their tunnels. And they have publicly said, I want as many of our civilians to die as martyrs as possible. We need that blood. It's it is really problematic as a, a student of war is if this strategy of Hamas has worked and by running with the Hamas civilian number, it's working on many fronts and it's really dangerous, I think, for the future. And it's it's actually shows that their doctrine or their their war concept was correct. I mean, their, their concept that all we have to do is survive because we know that dead or alive, if we survive in any way, for instance, in Rafa, then Israel loses. And all we need to do in order to survive is to wait because over, you know, after a few weeks or a couple of months, uh, a world opinion is going to change. It's going to turn on Israel. It's going to stand with us. We can depend on that happening and we can depend ultimately on the United States then calling for Israel to stand down, saying that its operations are over the top accepting our casualty numbers and uh, and accusing Israel of not abiding by the laws of war, et cetera, et cetera. So that it by that by by uh, by doing the sorts of things that we're seeing being done, and I'm trying to be careful because I know you work for West Point. I don't want to get you in trouble, but I mean, actually what we're seeing on the ground is that the Biden administration is living up to Hamas's expectations here. So you're right. I won't, I won't comment on what what anybody says politically but i will say is that you know having visited now twice that despite um people falling into the hamas trap is that the idf have continued operations they have continued clearing and and yes um they have had restrictions put on them that normally wouldn't be on a military like you can't go into those areas period until you evacuate them of a very high percentage of civilian casualties this is what I've seen now, their maps that the, the IDF handed out, that they're 
every single area is color coded on how many civilians are living there in which they use satellite imagery, cell phone presence, um, photos of buildings to determine what the civilian population and they don't go into those areas until the civilians have been removed or they um, they definitely don't conduct operations. But despite all the rhetoric, Caroline, and despite the political aspects of this, because all war is political, is that the IDF have continued. And they've continued to figure out a way. Um, and I was just in Khan Yunus two weeks ago. They figured out a, a way to take the tunnel advantage away from the enemy. They figured out a way to reduce civilian casualties down to, you know, and again, I don't like using the numbers, but one, okay, fine, we want to use one to one. They've reduced the civilian casualty to enemy combatant number to historic low numbers in a war, right? Not a counterterrorism, counterinsurgency operation. So despite so far the Hamas strategy hasn't worked, there is a possibility it could be, but it hasn't worked to stop the idea. What do you, what, when you were in San Yunus um, a couple of weeks back, what were your impressions of uh, the military forces that you saw there in terms of their, in terms of their professionalism, their overall performance and their esprit de corps, et cetera? How, how did you assess them? Yeah. I, I, and I know that you've been, you've done two tours of, of, of uh, duty in Iraq yourself. So I have, and I've traveled the world into military um, war zones in Ukraine, Nagorno Karabakh. Uh, studied battles all around the world. I mean, from my time um, with the 98th Division in Khan Yunus, I was significantly impressed by the morale, um, their understanding of the challenges, and, and you know, walking the ground. I had a, a much much deeper appreciation of the challenge where every building, every other building has a bomb in it, has a tunnel in it. Um, the just the sheer challenge of uh, moving through Detroit, let alone fighting an enemy there. I was really impressed uh, by the professionalism and the all the, and again, I guess what isn't getting briefed to the world, the steps that they're doing to not just limit the civilian harm, but make you basically prevent it. So uh, doing operations where they have to have such a high fidelity that there is no enemy there or no, no people there. I mean, of course there's enemy there. Um, and, then, and, and even trying to keep from Hamas just moving where the civilians go. And and that's been such a big challenge. But I was, I mean, really, uh, the, the rhetoric doesn't match the facts on the ground of what the IDF do to prevent civilian harm and how they take away Hamas's, you know, the advantages they have being the defender in this dense populated urban areas. You know, what's what's uh, interesting is that at the outset of the war, very shortly after October 7th, a lot of, uh, I don't know who they are, but some uh, very high-level American generals uh, came from the Pentagon to the Curia in Tel Aviv, uh, our military headquarters, and started giving advice to the IDF about how to organize the war, how to plan the ground operation, etc. And they continue to do so that based on their uh, experience fighting as you said, counterinsurgency warfare in I Iraq and Afghanistan. How how applicable do you believe that American uh, experience fighting in Iraq and Afghanistan is uh, today for IDF forces in in Gaza? And what are what are the similarities and differences? Yeah, it's a great question. And unfortunately, there, you know, I've been studying just this type of warfare across not just in Iraq and Afghanistan, but across the history of war. Um, urban combat and there are very few people uh especially in the u.s military that doesn't have urban warfare schools it doesn't have i mean it, it just doesn't study it so yeah you could say that they're relying on their experiences i mean there's not there's nobody left who that i mean there's one four-star general who was left from the second battle of fallujah which is when the u.s conducted a high intensity fight but not at this scale against this type of enemy with this type of tunnels, with hostages, with rockets. Um, there's nobody in the U.S. military who has that experience, so that's that's a fact. There is just nobody who's had that experience. Yes, we were involved in advise, assist, and providing support to Iraqi security forces in the Battle of Mosul, which is was the biggest urban battle since World War II, period. Uh, and there is some great information that was learned from there, but I can tell you, with very strong clarity that the Iraqi security forces are not the idea. They're just not. They're just, the way they, the equipment, the, the 
the the ability to learn their experiences, their technologies. It's not. But again, this is there is no similarity to U.S. experience unless you go back to World War II, and we had very limited experiences even in World War II. The Battle of Manila, the Battle of Aachen, uh, really were our two biggest urban battles that the U.S. military were involved in, and very few people even remember those battles, period, let alone remember what happened at those battles. So the, the, there's just no, there is no similarity, especially in the U.S. military, to this challenges that the IDF had faced, even in the political aspect. The U.S. military has, of course, been accu- of course, accused of war crimes, to include in assisting in operations against ISIS. The same players, air wars, and all the humanitarian groups were saying that the, the American forces are complicit in war crimes. Even in the Second Battle of Fallujah, there were like 80 claims of war crimes in the battle. Of, and this is the, the trend, though, of people believing there is a law of war without actually understanding there is a law of war. And what it takes, so there's a saying that we, that that if anybody's ever studied urban warfare knows is that um, even coming out of Vietnam, which wasn't urban at all, is that it became necessary to destroy the city to save it. And that's a really euphemism to understanding that if there is a defender who refuses to leave. And I think that's the actual other similarity that's not here either is that in many urban fights that the U.S. military or others have been in, to include the invasion of Iraq, is that the if the combatant doesn't fight, it isn't as struck, as destructive. The, uh, the Iraqi army didn't resist. Um, they were destroyed in the open. They didn't defend Baghdad, barely. So that's the other, where the analogies break apart, is when you can't reason with the enemy, and he doesn't care how many civilians... And in the case of Hamas, he actually wants as many civilians to die. He wants every photo of every destroyed building to be aired around the world. There is some uniqueness there as well, where, again, you have to go back to really the Japanese. Even the Germans in World War II would call cities open cities and would would leave cities rather than defend from them until the death. This is, again, where they, all the analogies and people's misunderstandings of war just really start to fall apart. And it, it becomes it becomes to a point where either you're that ignorant to what the challenges are and what it takes to over, overcome those challenges, or you're doing it intentionally. You're intentionally trying to turn information into weapons against Israel. So that's the other thing is that, you know, one of the very unique aspects I think of this war is the proximity of the of the battle space that you know as you uh, you know it's walking distance from our homes Gaza is it's, it's right there it's 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 adjacent to Israel it's just you know right here so that we're literally fighting for our for our lives we're fighting for our communities which were overrun on October 7th etc yeah. I, I agree that proximity is not there, right? So the American forces have never do, had to fight a war on their like that on the border, uh, it, or the rockets. I think people continue because this is it. This is the real frustrating part. Again, understanding war. This is a war. Yes, there are lessons from Iraq and Afghanistan in the post-conflict phase. Absolutely, you can lose a much larger war the day after, right? So this is the idea of, but there are actually definable metrics to the goals of the war against Hamas. Bring the hostages home, destroy Hamas, secure the borders. There are lessons, of course, after the destruction of Hamas from Iraq and Afghanistan, which we significantly messed up and had to learn lessons for a decade to understand how to fight counterinsurgencies. That's not this war. And I agree with you on the proximity, but what people continue to not say is of the rockets. It's like, well, Israel is the bigger power. What's the alternative to the war is stop. So just stop the war. That, that's what, you know, this idea of a, of, the, of a fact that you could do this in a different way is not true. And if you think that somebody else would do it in a different way, I can show you historically, yeah, the, if the U.S. military faced this problem of... Hundreds of our civilians, babies, children taken on our border, like let's say Mexico, 
rockets emanating from there within you know, a mile from from where the war is. Uh, all of these variables, yeah, we would do it differently, and it would be probably a lot more destructive um, and, and not listening to a lot of the outside rhetoric because we would have clearly legal, definable goals in the war. But yeah, the proximity is another question, but I think the rockets as well, because the ideal of just just stop, you could do this differently. Well, what about the rockets? Well, you know, you have the Iron Dome. Like That's not the same question. Oh, what about the, the hostages? Uh, they, they'll negotiate. Well, that, that's not true either. Uh, I, I think the alternative, all the rhetoric, it doesn't have an alternative. The alternative is just stop. That means Hamas achieves victory. That means the hostages don't come home. And that means every, you know over 100,000 Israelis can't go back to their homes if you include the North. And I know we'll talk about the North. I think this is really dangerous territory for the future of the world, in my opinion. Yeah, so the thing about uh, that I want to talk about you with, with uh, civilians, it goes to the question of, you know, we destroyed the village in order to save it. Because when you're looking at the level of support that Hamas enjoys, both in Gaza and, of course, in Judea and Samaria, um, then the question becomes, well, you know, how how the, the civilians were willing to have their homes used as entry points to subterranean tunnels. They were willing to have their their hospitals and schools serve as uh, Hamas uh, il- installations uh, for whatever purpose to have missiles shot at Israel from UNRWA uh, UNRWA clinics. Um, they're they're willing participants in in Hamas's war effort, and so when Israel is looking at both fighting the war today and also at the day after scenarios that are being bandied about, you know, what, when you're looking at it, where do you think that, how do you think that Israel should be assessing this environment going forward? Because they're going to be at our doorstep tomorrow also. Yeah. I mean, from a, it's a great question, but from the execution of the war, while that is all true, um, in Hamas is the governance uh, of Gaza, and Hamas is the military army of Gaza. It's more of a state-on-state state analogy that should be used. In the execution of the war, despite that assistance from the civilian population, that compliance, that uh, everything from the civilian population, in war, there's still, you have to separate combatant, non-combatant, and execute the war in that fashion. I want the laws of war followed. And this is why, you know, my first article on CNN was Israel is following the laws of war in going above them, period. You can debate other aspects of stopping, you know, water going in for a, a day or two, you know, you know, uh, the collective punishment ideal, but it's just not backed up by the evidence of the facts. I want the laws of war because if not, the brutality of war will continue to increase. And that's why the Geneva Conventions even said, you know, you can't target civilians. You have to limit the, take all these precautions. And that's what Israel is doing. Afterward, though, that is where it, it will matter on how do you move forward and what is the new construct where you just don't have, I mean, Hamas needs, has to be destroyed or they win, period. Yes, if depending on what you do the day after, especially with what everything, you know, Hamas was elected and then Hamas was allowed sanctuary and got support from the people to do all these things. Uh, but how do you create a, an environment where just Hamas 2.0, PJI, Lion's Den, or whatever, just doesn't take the mantle and become the new Hamas and and you know, take another decade to do another October 7th attack? That, that will be assessed as well militarily on how you do that. And there's lots of lessons, yes, from Iraq, Afghanistan, counterinsurgency history, is that you have to establish new power structures you have to do the disarmament. You have to do the re-education. You have to you know, help um, with all the essential services, all that. But there's separate questions, Caroline. How do you execute the war? You have to separate combatants and non-combatants like Israel has, despite all the help. But if you're a civilian engaging in the hostilities, this again goes back to the number, you're not a civilian. You're a combatant. That's just fact. That's the way it works. So then 
you know, the other aspect to this that's important to note is that God, that Hamas is a proxy. I mean, Hamas is a, is a, is a Sunni jihadist Muslim Brotherhood organization that, um, you know, is a, is a major component, the largest political force in Palestinian life. Uh, in Gaza and also uh, the most popular one in, in, in Judea and Samaria. But it's part of Iran's axis of, uh, of proxies. And so that too is an important aspect of understanding and being able to really kind of um, to, to assess the nature of the enemy that you're fighting. Because even in some of the uh, Hamas communications that were uncovered and, and exposed by the IDF during the course of the war, you saw that Sinwar said, Yafi Sinwar, the, the Hamas leader, that the invasion of October 7th was coordinated and approved by Iraq. So uh, let's just pivot for a second to to the uh, to the ally, to the partner in, in Lebanon. Everybody here thinks that you know we can't restore any sort of modicum of security to northern Israel without uh, a significant uh, military operation in Lebanon. Yeah, it's I a hundred percent agree with you that there's a, a one theme to all st- instability in the Middle East is Iran, all of its proxies, um, and this is a test of its grand strategy. To be honest, Hamas, or Shia, Sunni doesn't matter. Its proxy groups um, doing its will um, is a test of the the appeasement that the world has given Iran, or if not financial support that they've given Iran to try appease it hasn't worked and that October 7th not only changed Israel, it, it not only changed the security framework in the in the region, but it should have changed the world and how they deal with Iran and allowing it to continue these proxy wars um, on a scale that's never been done. I mean, it's just not, it's all of them. They all, Iran, is Hezbollah, Hamas, Houthis, the Shias of Iraq or, or the, the, the paramilitaries in, in Iraq, and I agree with you on the north is that on October 8th, Hezbollah attacked. Um, and, and I actually got to walk some of the ground in, in, in the north as well along the blue line. And I think if the world would acknowledge what Hezbollah has done um, would be step one. It's not just the rockets. It's direct attacks on IDF positions along the line, um, violation of an actual UN Security Council resolution. Uh, I don't. I think everybody was hoping that, you know, Iran Iran would tell Hezbollah to back up, um, to stop attacking Israel, and that doesn't happen. I mean, what needs to happen is that Israel has to secure its borders. I mean, even in that region, I never hear about it in the mainstream media either, is that there's 80,000, I mean, complete cities evacuated in northern Israel, not out of precaution because they're being attacked. 80,000 people still can't go home or living in hotels in Tel Aviv and schools all across Israel. Um, I, it, it's, it's actually concerning that it's not being talked about as much how much Hezbollah is attacking. And in any other case would be a, warrant a full-scale self-offensive war. And unfortunately, it's looking more and more like the military action will be required to secure Israel's borders. I mean, like there's Again, this is where people who don't want more war, of course, but what's the alternative? It, it's 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 alarming, and like you said, the the attacks are, and it's a different threat. I mean, it's not a Hamas; it's a much larger, much more capable, much more dangerous threat, which is hard to comprehend. Uh, looking at October seventh, which I think people are still denying what it is by calling it a terrorist attack. It wasn't a terror. Yes, they were terrorists. And they did terrorist things, but that was a full division level invasion of a nation uh, of Israel, and and people want to be you know basically downgrade what happened or forget about it in general, but now they're trying to just not even talk about what's happening in the north and what will be required. And there's a lot of there is some conversation, but um, I I'm not saying that a full scale ground attack is the only alternative. You, you would hope, and this gets into rational actor theory. Again, that one you would hope that Hamas would just surrender, um, so give up the hostages. In this situation, you would think Hezbollah would stop attacking, back up um, for their own survival, or Iran 
would, would tell them to do that since they do take all direction from the, the ultimate puppet master. When you looked on the ground in, in the north, but also when you were with our forces in, in Gaza, how much of what we're doing today in Gaza do you think will be applicable to Lebanon? I mean, of course, there'll be a different fight, right? So dense urban combat versus a much more open, uh, mountainous, hidden, wooded. Yeah, if, if you know the north, uh, how much concealment the woods provide. Um, it would be a completely different fight, but they're also, and Israel has now gained a lot of experience, and, and that's something unique to the IDF as well that I've studied for years, is that their ability to transform themselves, even with the tunnel threat, how they transform themselves from do ne never go into a tunnel to taking the tunnels away from Hamas, which is what they've done. Um, there, but there is a lot of combat experience gained in the last six months that will that has hardened um, and increased the performance of the idea for sure. It'll be a different terrain. It's a different threat. It will be um, much larger scale if that war happened. And the, again, the urban areas. So this is my problem with Hamas, again, trying to compare them to terrorists. Even ISIS didn't want all civilians to die. Yeah, they killed a lot of civilians, but even when they, they seized Mosul, they increased the amount of power they, because they were ruling by, by force. But the water, the power, all the services actually increased during their rule. Because they, if you didn't do it, you died. But where, where Hamas is, like you said, what I saw on October 7th was like, truly they released 4,000 Jeffrey Dahmers on Israel who have no remorse, who enjoy slaughter, um, who methodically killed. It wasn't incidental. And I wrote a, an article in Time Magazine about, as a military instructor, of how much precision in planning went into slaughtering civilians. Um, but they, they also have no respect for their own, if they, they could even have their own civilian life. And this is, again, a failure to recognize that their rationality isn't just that they, they want to die as martyr. They want as many of their own citizens to die, which is really unique, I, actually, in wars, to say that that's our strategy is to get as many of our people killed versus killing as many of their, even if they dehumanize the Jewish people, which they have, so much so. Uh, it'll be, I don't know if Hezbollah has that same mentality. Of course, they will are fine dying as modern, and Iran is fine with them dying as well. But there is a different calculation there if, when they will make a determination for their self-survival versus, you know, being martyrs for Iran. When you look overall at, at Israel, and I know you're going to be speaking uh, at the APAC conference this week in Washington, now, what what is the message that you really want to communicate as an urban warfare expert, as a professor at uh, at West Point? What what is it that you try to tell your students and uh, about what Israel experienced and is experiencing, and how they should be looking at this conflict in general? I mean, one of the things you know, if I was talking to a military audience, would be to one recognize the metrics in the performance of the idea um, by every metric. Um, has been incredible, but also their ability to take the advantage away from the enemy. Um, it's actually something we teach from a theoretical down to a tactical perspective is don't fight the way the enemy wants you to fight. Um, achieve the political goals you've been given in a unique way. And this is, even I have been surprised, and I teach um, this type of warfare, how the IDF have taken Hamas's advantages away from them. Whether it was even you know attacking from east to west right into the Hamas defenses or going around Hamas defenses, and that level of warfare, right? That is, you know, don't attack your enemy's strengths, attack their center of gravities, uh, use speed and surprise, despite the constraints that have been put on the idea. I mean, one of the messages I have is just recognize and acknowledge the amazing performance of the idea despite the challenges acknowledge the challenges and then recognize the performance of the idea and like you said they're also getting stronger every day and learning everything from army level you know the air ground integration the 
thinking through the challenge and finding a way which nobody has thought about on how to overcome those challenges. Um, so I have a lot of messages. One in make sure the criticism, if there is criticism, is actually backed by facts and evidence. But acknowledge the the positives as well as in the performance. You know, when I, I was I was in Iraq myself in two thousand and three, I was embedded with the Third Infantry Division, and um, and I saw that you know the the forces there really didn't have the right analogy when they went in. They they were talking about their grandfathers having um, liberated Paris uh, from the Nazis, and I said to them, "No, this isn't like that." And like, you know, this is the the analogy is Lebanon. And, you know, the, we went in there and just like the, the forces in the three, third ID, they, they went in and outside of Nasseria, everybody was doing thumbs up and go America to them. And that's what happened to our soldiers in Lebanon in 1982. We went into the Shiite villages in South Lebanon and they threw rice at our boys. And, you know, and then, then uh, Amal became Hezbollah and then, you know, the PLO became Amal, Amal became Hezbollah and they just chewed us up you know, and spit us out. And that's very similar to what the, the happened to U.S. forces over time, again, over time in, in Iraq and, and other places. And so, you know, we for years have been hearing, to, you know, since the Cold War that ended, that high-intensity conflict, conventional warfare has ended, and now it's all low-intensity conflict and asymmetric warfare. And what you were describing in terms of Hamas as a military uh, and obviously, Hezbollah is even is a much larger military. They have an air force. It's made up of unmanned aerial vehicles and drones, et cetera, but, uh, and rockets and missiles, et cetera. But what we're really seeing here is a new form of warfare, which is, well, I don't know, new, but it is high-intensity conflict. It is military to military, just that the militaries are very different from one another. One is a conventional force, and one is a force that was built around a specific enemy that the force structure is built it's not a generic. Okay, we're going to have infantry and artillery and 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 all the rest of it. We're gonna we're we're making up a hybrid force that's directed specifically towards annihilating Israel. So on a scale of uh, uh, of uh, one to ten, what kind of grade do you think that Israel deserves for its its uh, its fighting of the war in Gaza? At least an eight or a nine, um, just by matched against the challenges. I mean, there's nobody perfect, right? So uh, this is like the the most I also don't agree with the most moral, right? Because I served in the U.S. military, you know. Um, it, the IDF, of course, is a very moral, law-abiding, ethical force. Their performance in this war warrants eight or a nine, as in despite the challenges in every metric that we talked about, they're getting the job done. They're achieving victory. They're destroying in their the other military. They're achieving the political goals, which is what war is about. Um, so despite the rhetoric. And, and do you feel confident if Israel has to fight in, in Lebanon that we're going to be able to do it successfully? So this is the problem with predicting wars is that you, you, you can't hold all variables um, the, you know, in, in constant. Israel, of course, can defeat Hezbollah, but that your power is not just your military force. Your power is your diplomatic, your allies, uh, all the support that you need in order to defend yourselves. I'm confident that Israel, if the United States stays with Israel like it should, um, can can achieve secure its borders, yes. All right. Well, thanks. I'm going to leave it at that. I appreciate very much uh, your honesty and your dispassionate uh, analysis of what's happening. I think it's extremely important for people to be listening to you. I wish that there were more people like you around who were capable of dispassion and analysis. And uh, and God bless you. I look forward to meeting you in person next time you're back in Israel. Thanks very much. Thanks so much. All right. Take care. And, and we'll be back here uh, later this week with another uh, analysis of what's going on because things keep changing so fast. I just have to keep my mouth running. Anyway, I'll see you guys soon. And thank you again so much, uh, Professor Spencer, for coming and joining me today. 